Hello everybody and welcome again for another video from MedTube channel on electrolyte disturbances and today's topic is about hypernatremia and starting with the definition hypernatremia is defined as a serum sodium concentration above 145 milliequivalents per liter now please note that hypernatremia is always hyperosmolar unlike hyponatremia as we have seen in the previous video and that's because of the following mechanisms by which hypernatremia occurs. The first one is unreplaced free water loss, which is known as dehydration, not hypovolemia. Because dehydration means free water loss without the solutes, whereas hypovolemia means you're losing the free water along with the solutes. And hypovolemia usually results in hyponatremia, as we have seen in the previous video. The second mechanism is sodium overload, as in salt intake without water or in administration of hypertonic solutions to the patient. A third mechanism would be water loss or water shift into the cells, and this leaves the extracellular compartment to be hyperosmolar. Now please note again that your patient must not be alert and or must not sense thirst as in elderly or critically ill patients and or not have access to free water intake as seen in infants or again in elderly and that's because if your patient senses the thirst and drinks free water your hypernatremia will be corrected so your patient must not sense thirst and or must not have access to free water in order for hypernatremia to occur now hypernatremia usually presents with neurological symptoms secondary to shrinkage of the brain cells unlike the brain edema seen in hyponatremia and the shrinkage of the brain cells is because of the osmotic shift of water out of the brain cells into the extracellular compartment and mostly symptoms occur in the acute hypernatremia that's hypernatremia lasting up to 24 hours and your exact pathophysiology of how symptoms occur is the following your shrinkage of the brain cells will first cause the neurological symptoms and they may also cause the rupture of the cerebral veins causing focal intracerebral and subarachnoid hemorrhages and therefore possibly leading to irreversible neurological damage and finally the shrinkage of the brain cells could also cause osmotic demyelination syndrome so let's proceed now with the etiology and classification of hypernatremia and again we have three mechanisms the first one is water loss into the cells the second one is sodium overload and the third one is unreplaced water losses which is the most common category so let's first start with the two small categories and then proceed with a large one so starting with water loss into the cells and this leaves the extracellular compartment to be hyperosmolar as seen in severe intense exercise or seizures and what happens in these conditions is that the cells break down their glycogen into smaller and more osmotically active molecules and therefore drawing water into the cells and this leaves the extracellular compartment to be hyperosmolar and now going to the second mechanism which is sodium overload as seen in salt poisoning which could be accidental or intentional or as seen in iatrogenic sodium loading as seen in hypertonic solutions however even isotonic solutions such as normal saline could actually cause hypernatremia in certain conditions such as if you have a patient with hypotonic fluid loss as in osmotic diuresis due to hyperglycemia or mannitol or in a patient recovering from azotemia therefore the urea causing the osmotic diuresis or if you have a patient after nasogastric suction and that's because the fluid lost will be hypotonic in relation to the plasma or if you have a patient on loop diuretics because the loop diuretics will cause more free water loss in relation to the solutes and therefore loops will cause hypotonic fluid loss so if you have any of these conditions and you replace the patient with an isotonic saline there will be a sodium overload because the isotonic saline lead is considered to be hyperosmolar in relation to the fluid that has been lost 
And now going to our last and final category which is unreplaced war losses and this is the most common category and of course we have several routes by which we can lose water and the first one is urinary losses in which you typically have high urine output the second is GI losses and the third is skin losses and finally the fourth mechanism is due to simply a suppressed thirst so starting with the urinary losses it could be further categorized into the following if you have a hypoosmolar urine which is a urine osmolality below 300 milliosmoles per kilogram then it's probably diabetes insipidus if your urine is hyperosmolar which is a urine osmolality above 600 milliosmoles per kilogram then it's probably an osmotic diuresis and if you have a urine osmolality between 300 to 600 milliosmoles per kilogram then it would be an intermediate urine osmolality and it could be due to either causes either diabetes insipidus or osmotic diuresis and of course diabetes insipidus could be either central or nephrogenic whereas in osmotic diuresis you will have an osmotically active substance which is excreted through the urine and is drawing water along with it as seen in hyperglycemia or mannitol use and finally please note that almost all the conditions of hypernatremia will usually have a hyperosmolar urine but not because of the osmotic diuresis as seen in here but rather because of the ADH release trying to correct the hypernatremia and now coming to the GI losses which is primarily talking about vomiting and osmotic diarrhea both of which result in a hypotonic fluid loss however if you have a prolonged vomiting or a prolonged diarrhea there will be more release of ADH therefore causing more free water retention and there will be more thirst causing more oral intake of free water so therefore with this chronic replacement of free water along with the ongoing loss of sodium and water through vomiting and diarrhea there will be at the end a depletion of the body sodium and therefore resulting in a dilutional hyponatremia both due to the decrease in the total body sodium and due to the free water oral intake and retention through ADH release and now coming to skin losses which could be any of the following we have insensible losses which is water loss transepidermally through diffusion we have sensible losses which is sweating or we have burns and all of those cause hypotonic fluid loss and therefore resulting in hypernatremia however again with the same story repeated in vomiting and diarrhea if you have prolonged or severe sweating and burns they could result in hyponatremia due to the same mechanisms that I have already explained for vomiting and diarrhea and finally coming to the suppressed thirst category and if the thirst is just decreased we call it hypodipsia whereas if the thirst is absent we call it adipsia and we have two main causes the first one is adipsic diabetes insipidus which is absent ADH plus absent thirst so it's a central diabetes insipidus with the absence of the thirst response which could be due to a variety of congenital or acquired CNS lesions and the second main cause is hypothalamic lesions such as holoprosencephaly which results in impairment of the thirst response and different hypothalamic lesions could present with impairment of the thirst response with or without a central diabetes insipidus this is all for the etiology and classification of hypernatremia and again there are few other causes which are not mentioned in this classification now let's move to the management of hypernatremia and as always management starts when you first see the patient so that's starting with history taking and first we ask the patient for any dehydration such as polyuria as seen in diabetes insipidus and osmotic diuresis we also ask for any history of vomiting any history of diarrhea or burns or even sweating we ask the patient any history of intense exercise or seizures or any history of salt intake and then we go to the physical examination we assist the patient for any dehydration signs such as decreased skin turgor or dry mucous membranes or even decreased urine output and flat JVP and if dehydration is severe the patient would also have hypotension we also expose the skin looking for any burns 
So that's pretty much all which you could find in physical examination. And then we go to the investigations and we start with the plasma and the urine osmolality, the urinary electrolytes, and we also add a 24 hour urine collection assessing the urine output and then looking for the glucose level. Of course, investigation would include much more than this, but this is just a summary of the most important ones. And finally, we move to the treatment of hyperinatremia. And in summary, what we want to do is to decrease the sodium level. So since the patient is already dehydrated, it will be unlogical to give a diuretic. And therefore, we replace the free water. So we give free water per os or a bionasogastric tube. And if not possible, we would give an IV 5% dextrose in water. Unless the patient is hypervolemic, then we would give a diuretic. And if the patient has a renal failure, then we would go for dialysis. Of course, then we would have to treat the underlying cause. So if it's a diarrhea or a vomiting or burns, we have to treat the underlying cause. And finally, we have to avoid rapid correction of the serum sodium, and that's to prevent any cerebral edema. And that's why the usual recommendation is to decrease the sodium level by less than 10 milliequivalents per liter per 24 hours and never more than 12. So your maximum limit is 12 milliequivalents per liter per 24 hours. That would be all for hypernatremia. Thank you very much for watching. I really hope that you have liked this video. And you are more than welcome to check out my next video on hypokalemia.